Reusability is an important part of programming. We want to be able to do more with our code without constantly having to adjust or expand upon the code that we have already written. Today, we're going to refactor our core to increase its reusability. The core is meant to be a hub where an entity can get access to a variety of components to help it interact with the environment. Currently, our core gives the entities, such as our player or enemies, access to the following core components. Movement, collision senses, combat, and stats. As it stands, these components are somewhat required by every entity. Even if an entity were to not make use of, say, the combat core component, the core still knows about it. The core knows about every component. Yes, if an entity does not use a certain core component, we can just not add the game object and related scripts, but this is not an elegant solution. So today we're gonna to solve this by making the way our core handles core component references more dynamic. So to solve this issue, we're gonna get rid of all the hard-coded core component references our core has and replace it with a list. We can then make the core components add themselves to the list of their parent core. In the core, we can then create a function that'll be used to find and return a core component from this list when it is needed. Other scripts that make use of certain core components can then call this function and cache the reference to that component. That way it's on constantly looking through the list. By doing this, the core is no longer aware of the specific core components it is responsible for and merely acts as a general hub for the core components. Okay, so let's go ahead and actually get started. To start off with, let's go ahead and open up our core script. In the core script, we're gonna start by removing all of these hard-coded references that we've set up earlier. So just go ahead and select all of those, including these ones down here, and we'll just delete them. Because we are no longer making use of those hard-coded references, we can also go ahead and get rid of the code where we set those references in the awake function. In the previous part, we created this components list. The purpose of this list was to store a reference to each one of the core components and was used to call the logic update function on each one of those components. So let's just go ahead and reuse this list. Instead of the type being iLogicUpdate, let's go ahead and change this to core component. And I'm also gonna go ahead and rename the list to core components. One final thing I'm going to do is after private, we're gonna go ahead and say read only. So this read only keyword is not critical. It just helps protect the list during runtime and stops us from accidentally reassigning the list to a different list. With the changes made to this list, let's go ahead and take a look at our add component function. So instead of taking a iLogic update input parameter, we're gonna change that to a core component. So when a core component calls this function, it'll still add itself to this list. Next, let's go ahead and take a look at our logic update function. Now, we don't really need to make this change because each one of our core components does implement iLogic update, but really we don't actually need that interface anymore. We could have just kept it as core component. So let's just go ahead and change that. So whenever we run the game, each core component will add itself to this list. So this means now each core has references to the core components that it's actually using. What we need next is our method to retrieve references to these core components to be used elsewhere. So how are we going to do that? We're gonna do that with a generic function. So let's go ahead and quickly create a new function. The function is going to be public because we can call it from outside of the script. And because we are creating a generic function, the return type is going to be T. I'm then going to call this function get core component. We can then open up some angle brackets and say t again to specify that this is a generic function and then put in some braces where we would have input parameters. Now this function does not have any input parameters and I'll explain why in just a second. After this, we can then go ahead and say where t colon is a core component. So what we're saying here is that we have a generic function and the generic type is t, 
and we say that our function is going to return an object that has the type t. But we're also saying where t is a core component. So that means we're constraining the types that can be used with this generic function to only be core components. So any of the core components that we created can be used as the generic type because they all inherit from core component. We can then go ahead and open and close some brackets. So now inside this function, the first thing we need to do is look through our core components list and see if we can find the core component that we're looking for. And to do this, we're gonna make use of the link library. So let's go ahead and go to the top of our file and underneath using Unity Engine, we'll also add using system.link. So now we can go back to our function and let's make use of our link library to query our core components list and find the core component that we're actually looking for. Now notice that our get core component doesn't have any input parameter. So how do we say which core component we're looking for? And the trick is the fact that this is a generic function. So we're making use of the type that we set this function to be as the type that we are looking for. So if we're looking for our movement core component, we'll say get core component, square bracket, movement, square bracket. And then we can simply look through our list to see if any of the core components has that specific type. So let's go ahead and do that. We can say core components and then dot of type. Now of type is a method provided by the link library and it takes the list and filters it to only contain objects that are of the type T. So we can pass our generic type T into this function like that. So now at this point, we'll have a collection of potentially zero or more objects that have this type T. So we need to refine our search a little further. To do this, we can say dot first or default like that. So what this is going to do is it's going to take the collection returned by of type and it's going to take the first element in that collection or if the collection doesn't have any elements, it'll return the default value for whatever type we're using. Now, because our type is a class, it'll return null if nothing was found. Let's go ahead and store the result of this in a variable. And we're just going to use var in this case because we don't know the type that is being returned by this function. And we'll just call it comp. And just set it equal to all of that. After searching through our list for that specific type, we can then go ahead and check to see if we have found anything or not. So we can say if comp equals equals null, in this case, it means we did not find anything. We can say debug dot log warning. And the warning message will simply tell the developer that a script is trying to use a core component that they have not implemented yet or added to an entity. So this basically replaces that generic error that we created earlier. So in here, we can go ahead and create a message and starting with the dollar sign and then our double quotation marks. Now, the first thing we want to say in the message is which type was not found. So we can open up some squiggly brackets and we can say type of and then pass in T. And then we can say not found on and then which game object this is. So transform dot parent dot name. So this will tell the developer which core component was not implemented on which entity. After this, we can simply return comp. So this function is going to either return a core component or null. So this is the function that other scripts will use to get access to the core component that they are looking for. But now, how do we actually make use of this get core component function? Well, if we go back to Unity, we're going to be greeted with a lovely sight, and that is 122 errors. So let's go ahead and tackle this slowly. Let's start off with our player. Our player's finite state machine already makes use of a lot of the core components like the movement and collision senses. It makes use of the movement core component to apply velocity to the character and the collision senses core component to find out if it's grounded and things like that. So let's go ahead and open up our player's grounded super state. So that'll be in scripts, player, player states, super states, and player grounded state. So let's take a look at what errors we have here. 
So you can see that in our do checks function, our player grounded state is trying to look at the collision census score component and get all this information to make use of in the state logic. So the first thing we need to do is create a variable to hold our collision senses. So let's go ahead and come up to the top. And seeing as this is a private variable, I'll create it underneath the protected variables. We'll just say private collision senses. And we'll just call it collision senses again. I'll forgive the change in formatting. I have swapped over to Visual Studio Code from Visual Studio just to help with the look of the videos. And so some of the files still have the old formatting. So please just bear with me. Okay, so now that we have this collision senses variable, we can come back down to our errors. And now we no longer need to access collision senses through our core like this. So let's go ahead and click on all of these. Now, I don't know if you can do this on Visual Studio, but in Visual Studio Code, if you hold an alt, you can place down multiple cursors like this. So we can go ahead and change each one of these to simply be collision senses like that. But now we have an issue. We have this collision senses variable and we're making use of it over here, but we're never setting the initial reference to the collision senses core component. So where are we going to do that? Now, we have a couple of issues. Usually we set these references in some sort of awake function. However, our states do not have an awake function. Yes, we have this constructor, which technically acts like an awake function, but not really. You see, we cannot guarantee that our core components awake functions got called before any sort of awake function that we might have in here. So we cannot guarantee that every core component has been added to the list on the core that we're going to access to look for this core component. So instead, what we're going to do is simply cache the reference at runtime the first time the core component is used. So how do we do that? Let's go ahead and go back up to our variable declaration. And above it, let's create another variable. This one will also be private of type collision senses. And this time we'll call it collision senses with a capital C like this. And we do that because this one is going to hold a getter and a setter. So in here we can say get. And so then our get function is first going to check if our collision senses does not equal null. And so we can just say collision senses like that as it knows what we mean. And then if this is the case, we're going to return collision senses. However, if this is not the case, meaning we have not yet set this reference, we're going to try and set the reference now with collision senses equals core dot get core component. And then we pass in the type collision senses. Like that. Once we've done that, we can then go ahead again and return collision senses. Now, because we're not doing anything special with our setter, we don't need to put that here. We then need to come back down to our do checks function and change these collision senses to the one that has a capital C. Because when we try and look at the collision senses core component, we want to call that getter to make sure that the reference has actually been set. And if not, try and set the reference. What we're also going to do is wrap all of this in an if statement to first check whether we actually have a reference to the collision senses core component before we try and access any of these properties on it. This is just to help clean up the amount of errors that we log in the console, making it easier for the developer to spot what is wrong. So we'll say if collision senses, and it's important that this is the capital case collision senses, so if that does not equal null, then do all of this. Okay, so this should do, but let's go ahead and take another look at our variable over here. Notice that this is quite a lot to write out and we have a lot of core components being used all over the place. So what is a more concise way that we can write this? Well, we can make this more concise by making use of the null coalescing operator. And I'll explain to you in just a second what that is. Let's just go and get rid of everything inside of the get function. We'll just go ahead and rewrite it like this. So we'll start with an arrow function and we'll say collision senses. This is the one with the lowercase c. And then we put a double question mark. 
That is the null coalescing operator. And what this does is it says, if the left-hand side is not null, return the left-hand side. And if it is null, then return the right-hand side. So on the right-hand side, we can then say core dot get core component, and then pass in the type collision senses. But now we have one last issue, and that is that calling core.getCoreComponent does not actually set our reference. It'll simply return the core component, which is then returned by this overall function, but that is not stored over here. We could try and say collision senses equals that, but this doesn't work. It gives us an error, even if we spell it correctly. Now there's an easy way to solve this if you're using Unity 2021.2 or later. And that is to, instead of trying to do that, putting an equal sign here. And what this does is it stores whatever the right-hand side returns in the left-hand side. But I'm still using Unity version 2019, so unfortunately I cannot make use of this. So we're going to have to find a different way to solve this. But if you're using a later version of Unity, feel free to just do that and skip ahead of it. So how can we solve this? What we can do is create another version of our get core component function that does take in an input parameter. And the input parameter is going to be the variable where we want to store the reference. Let me show you what I mean. Let's go ahead and come back to our core script. And after our get core component function, let's go ahead and create another one. We'll say public t get core component. And then the type is again t. And now this time inside the brackets, I'm going to say ref t value. And so what this means is we're going to pass in an object. We're calling it value locally. The type of the object is going to be t, our generic type. And we're passing it in as a reference. Usually when you pass something through a parameter, you pass in a copy of that value. But if you put the ref keyword in front of it, you're now actually referencing where that data is stored instead of just the value of that data. And again, after this, we just say where T is a core component. Inside of this, we can then simply say value equals get core component. And we pass in T again, like that. So from this get core component function, we're calling our first one and we're storing the value that it returns inside of this value parameter that we passed. After that, we can then again go ahead and just return value. So now if we come back to our player grounded state, over here we can come and pass in our collision census variable as a reference. So inside of the brackets, we simply say ref again, collision senses. So now what we can do is actually get rid of our angled brackets like that because we can infer the type of the generic function from what we pass in over here. And that again, just makes it a little bit shorter. And that's it. Let's go ahead and clean this up because we can now go ahead and write this in a single line. Now, unfortunately for me, there's some wrapping, but you get the point. So if we go ahead and save this and go back to Unity, you'll see that we have four fewer errors. So we still have a lot of work ahead of us. We now know our process for fixing these errors. And there's a reason that I started with the player grounded state. And that's because, like I said, it's one of our super states. This means that any variables that we declare over here, as long as we declare them as protected, will be accessible to any of the children states. Now, none of the player grounded states, children states make use of collision senses, so we can keep it private but a lot of the substates make use of our movement core component. So instead of going to each one of those and declaring a movement variable and caching the reference there, we can first go ahead and cache it in our super states and that'll decrease the amount of work that we actually have to do. So in our player grounded state, let's actually go ahead above our collision senses and let's declare a protected movement and we'll just call it movement with a capital M. And in here we can say get arrow function, and then we're going to return movement with a lowercase m, but we don't actually have this variable yet. So let's go ahead and declare that first. This one I'm actually going to declare private 
because we only want to make use of our uppercase movement, not our lowercase movement. So we'll say private movement, lowercase movement, like that. Now back up here, we can say movement, null coalescing operator, core dot get core component. And we're going to pass in a ref to our movement variable like that. So let's go ahead and take a look at the substates to our player grounded state. So let's come to our substates folder. Let's make this a little bit bigger. Okay. So our substates are our player move state, player idle state, player crouch move state, player crouch idle state, and then our player land state. So let's go ahead and work through each one of those and see how we fix the errors. Let's start with our player move state. So let's go ahead and see what errors we have here. If we scroll down, we can see that in our logic update function, we're trying to use our movement core component to check if we should flip and also to set our X velocity. Now we can fix this by simply getting rid of the core dot in front of movement. So now we're referencing the movement variable that we declared on our player grounded state. And it's as simple as that. Again, forgive the formatting that just happened there. Now, one more thing that we can do here is after movement, we can go ahead and add a question mark. And so what that means is it'll only call our check if should flip or set velocity x functions if movement is not null. Now, again, this is just one of those things where we can decrease the amount of errors that clog up our console when something goes wrong so that it's easier for our developer to find that warning message that tells him he forgot to add a core component to a certain entity. So yeah, that's basically all we have to do in this substate. Let's take a look at our player idle state. So in here, again, we just have our core dot movement calling our set velocity function, get rid of the core in front of movement, and then add a question mark afterwards. And so that's another error handled. Let's go ahead and come back to Unity again. And this time, let's go ahead and take a look at our crouch move state. So in here, we have a similar situation. We can go ahead and get rid of the core dot in front of movement. But now notice that inside of our set velocity x function, we're making use of the movement core component again. Now we simply get rid of core dot in front of it, and this time it's fixed. But now we need to go ahead and add in those question marks. So if we add it, over here and here, everything is fine. But let's go ahead and add one over here as well. You'll see that it's going to give us an error. Let's take a look at that error. So you see that it says cannot convert from float question mark to float. Now what this means is because we add this question mark afterwards, we say that this potentially could be null, but the function is expecting a float, it does not know how to handle null. So we just simply cannot have this question mark here. But it doesn't really matter because this function will not get called if movement is null anyway. So yeah, we add the question marks on the outside, but not the inside. So let's save that and head back to Unity. Next, we have our crouch idle state. So in here, we simply call our set velocity zero function on our movement core component. So again, we fix it by just getting rid of that and adding a question mark after movement. And that does it for all of our grounded substates. Let's go ahead and go back to Unity and see how many errors we have left. So just 111. 111, go ahead and make a wish. So what happens next? Well, basically we just do the same thing for the rest of the states. Let's go ahead and look at which core components are required by each of the substates and which super state we can declare those in. So if we take a look at our superstates folder, we have three superstates. We've taken care of one already. Let's consider our player ability state. In our player ability state, we're going to declare a private collision senses and a protected movement because the movement is used in the player attack state, the player dash state, the player jump state, and the player wall jump state. Collision senses again is just used by the superstate. In our player touching wall state, we have the same thing private collision senses and protected movement. The movement is then used in our player wall slide state, our player wall grab state, and our player wall climb state. After this, we have two substates that don't belong to any super states, 
and that is our player in air state and our player ledge climb state. So you can just simply fix those errors that appear there inside the scripts themselves. I'm now going to do a little montage of me fixing these errors. I don't think it's necessary to talk over all of it. And so you can pause it at any time if you need to see what I'm doing. Otherwise, you can always check the GitHub link to see what changes I actually made. So you can see that taking care of all of our players' state errors took care of a decent chunk of the errors that we actually had. So where are the rest of these errors? So a lot of these errors are going to exist on our enemy states. Now unfortunately our enemies still make use of an older version of the finite state machine and thus they do not make use of our super state substate system that we made. So unfortunately, we're going to have to fix each one of these errors on those states individually. So let's go ahead and do that. We can come to our enemies folder, states, and then go through each one of these. So in our attack state, you can see over here, we have core movement and core movement as well. So at the top, we can again come and declare variables for our core components. Now our attack state only makes use of movement, so we can go ahead and create a private movement movement like that, and then another private movement movement. The getter that calls movement or core dot get core component with our movement variable reference like that. And then where we have our errors, we can again just change it to movement like that. And don't forget our question marks. And again, you just follow this same process for the rest of the enemy states. Just note, however, that our enemy one player detected state actually also makes use of the movement core component. So in the base player detected state, just use protected instead of private. But again, I'm just gonna speed this up and you can pause it if you need to take a look or you can always check out the files on GitHub. Okay, and so that takes care of all the enemy states, and we only have 14 errors left. These remaining errors come from our other core components, trying to look for certain core components, or our weapon scripts. So let's go ahead and quickly fix those as well. 
let's start with our core components. Let's come back to our core components folder and let's open up our combat core component. As you can see, our combat core component makes use of stats and movement and collision senses. So let's go ahead and create the references for all three of those. I'm just going to paste in the ones that I've been using so far. So that is our movement and collision senses. And then we simply need to add our stats. So private stats, call it stats. And then over here we have private stats, stats with a getter that returns our stats or core dot get core component with a reference to our stats variable. Hopefully that makes it a little bit easier to see what's going on here. So let's take a look at the errors. So we'll say stats question mark decrease health. So if we don't actually have a reference to our stats component, don't give me an error. And then over here by our movement core component, we can get rid of that. And again, add our question marks. So again, just do it where we can down here. And that takes care of all the errors on our combat core component. If we take a look, we have eight left. So let's see where the rest of these errors are. I'm just going to start with the top one and double click it to see where it opens. And this one appears to be on our enemy entity script. So our entity script makes use of our movement core component. So let's just go ahead and add that over here as well. Go ahead and paste this in and I'll get rid of collision senses because I don't need that one. And I'll over here notice that I'm actually using a capital C core instead of lowercase c. And then we can go ahead and just fix these errors like normal. Come back to Unity and we have four left. So three of them seem to be on our collision senses core component itself. Okay, so our collision senses core component makes use of our movement core component to get the direction that we're facing. So let's go ahead and add our movement core component here as well. like that and then we can come down to our errors and again just get rid of the core dot in front of movement and that takes care of those three errors finally we have one error on our aggressive weapon script let's go ahead and open up that and see what it's all about so again our aggressive weapon just makes use of the movement core component to determine the facing direction and then come down to the air and just change it to movement. Now, if we come back to Unity, that should have taken care of all of our errors. So that's basically it. Our core now no longer has hard-coded references to each one of these core components, which currently doesn't really make sense because each one of our entities, meaning our player and two enemies, make use of the same core components, but going forward, they're going to change. We're going to have different core components for our different entities. For example, before in our collision senses core component, we added an extra check over here just to accommodate our enemy, but our player does not make use of this check. So in the future, we're actually gonna get rid of this check from here and move it into a separate core component that just our enemies are going to implement and not our player. But we're gonna save that for a later part. For now, this part was just focusing on refactoring our core to make it more reusable. And I hope you guys see the power of what we just did and how now in the future, we can add any core components we want to any of our entities and it'll work no matter what. So before we go, it's probably a good idea to just test it and make sure everything is working right. So we can still move, we can still jump, we can still attack and we can still hit our target dummy. So yeah, that does it for this part. I know that was a lot of error fixing, 
but that's always good practice. I hope you guys enjoy that. And before I go, I would just like to say thank you to all of my supporters and wonderful people over on Patreon. And a huge special thank you to Jake, Kareem, Madger, SM, Rayua, and Cody Lee for your support. You guys are absolute mad lads. And yeah, I hope you guys have a wonderful day.